Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Indivisible Illinois Community Collaborative Meeting hosted by the Social Justice Alliance. We are being recorded. I'd like to begin by saying happy Women's History Month to everyone out there. And tonight's topic is going to be about the race class narrative. I'm Jonathan Rogoff, a co-lead of the Social Justice Alliance team and a member of Indivisible IL-9. Uh, tonight, we're welcoming Angela Lang, Executive Director of Block, Jessica Motzinger, State Campaign Organizer for the Illinois for Repairs of the Breach and the Poor People's Campaign, and Penn Garvin, Facilitator for the Hub for Progress. But before I turn it over to these amazing speakers, I want to provide a little background on the Social Justice Alliance and, of course, acknowledge the war crimes happening in Ukraine. Um, a link to this art. The next slide, please. Uh, thank you. Um, a, link to, um, a link to this art from a prior speaker, David Pepper, is just one of many ways that you can contribute to the relief, leper, to relief efforts, and a link with more details will be provided in the chat. Uh, so now on to SJA, and, uh, and it, our, the, our group was launched two years ago during the pandemic in 2020. With COVID-19 becoming more and more apparent, we wanted to make sure that voters had safe, secure, and fair access to their vote. It also became clear that the most at risk were voters of color that may have difficulty getting to the polls with limited locations and staff. We decided to focus on vote by mail as an opportunity for voters who wanted to vote safely at home. We also discovered that underserved communities would face more risks than other voters. So we reached out to various community leaders, such as Communities Partnering for Peace, Action Now, Black Millennial Renaissance, Illinois Muslim Coalition, and the Hispanic Institute, among others, to find out how to include voters and make sure that all, that all voices were heard. Some of our accomplishments uh, since then include the virusfreevotingillinois.org website that consolidated information so anyone in the state could find what they needed for their jurisdiction for the 2020 election. Uh, successful Twitter storms to get the word out with over 60 million impressions, distribution of over 8,000 voter registration and vote by mail placards in English and Spanish, or, and organization of regular phone banks contacting over 5,000 voters in underserved communities to get out the vote pursuing equity and justice. I also want to give a grateful shout out to Bill Davis, co-lead at NWSFA and his promotional machine. <coughs> Uh, that has drawn in our broad and engaged audience of advocates on a regular basis on our Saturday meetings and to some extent for this meeting. With that, I will turn it over to Kathy who will explain how to engage with the Social Justice Alliance. Hi everyone, my name is Kathy Rosberg. I'm one of the co-leads of the Social Justice Alliance. And one of the easiest ways to engage with us is each Saturday, we meet at noon on Zoom. So. We encourage you to come and join us. Along with my other co-leads, Rose Calcino, Kim Garnett, and Jonathan Rogoff, I'm really excited to be part of this group. This has been an amazing place and space for me during Zoom, and I'm sure it's been for all of you who've been joining us. It's really been wonderful to see everything that has been accomplished before I got here, and I'm excited about the things that we will be doing in the future. And we're so glad that you're here to be part of this. We are a multiracial, ethnic, generational coalition pursuing a more diverse, engaged, inclusive electorate by educating voters and advocating policies that directly impact underserved communities through empowering, supporting, and elevating frontline groups to achieve economic and political and social justice. You can contact us here and you can follow us on Facebook and you can follow us on Twitter. What I really love about the Social Justice Alliance is the monthly meeting structure that we recently put into effect. The first week of every month, we focus on our underserved community partners. You, you can see some of them listed up here. The second week, we are really focused on suppression-free democracy with our roadmap to 2022. Our third week, we have a messaging discussion and we've been for the last seven weeks blessed with Joyce Slavic and Jim McGrath who present 
the latest updates on confronting school board uh, disinformation or just dis disinformation at school board meetings. In our fourth week, we focus on voter registration with field team six and IL vote. So these are amazing opportunities and we encourage you to come to all four. And of course, there are so many future events happening here. Uh, the Vote by Mail Task Force has a phone back to Wisconsin voters every Saturday at four. So you can join us this Saturday on March 19th. And then this coming Saturday at noon on the 19th, again, is the Confronting Disinformation School Board meetings. And something really important happened last night. There was an event to highlight the anti-trans laws that are unfortunately uh, being attempted to be passed in Illinois. And I'm gonna be putting some links uh, to different groups that you can contact and especially contacting your senators. This uh, bill has passed the house. It's now stalled in the Senate, I think right now. And we are very excited here at uh, the Social Justice Alliance that our next Wednesday event on April 27th will be with Words That Win. And you'll be able to get a introductory seminar training to strategic messaging, which we're also going, going to be getting today too with the race class narrative. And now I'll turn this over to, to our Introducer Actually, of Angela. Yes, yes, I am so excited. It is uh, such an honor, Angela. I'm so happy to have you here this evening. First of all, let me give you a short introduction of myself and good evening to everyone here. I'm Rose Colosino, co-lead of Indivisible Illinois and co-lead and founder of this group. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Angela Lang. I'm much older, Angela, I know that for a fact, but uh, you are who I wanna be when I grow up. And I, I mean that. I first met Angela in 2018 and she's actually everybody, the reason why I am uh, in deep in Wisconsin. It's because of you, Angela, thank you. So way back when in um, 2018 is when I met her, I went to Wisconsin because uh, I had a premonition guys that Wisconsin was going to be very important and was in fact going to be again, the uh, tipping point state. Angela, even younger then was a very powerful presence and uh, her staff at Black could not have been more gracious to two white people, <laughs> my husband and myself running around in Milwaukee uh, canvassing and knocking on doors. And I'll tell you that that was a memorable experience. I um, spoke with so many people that had not had their door knocked on to ask them about their vote up until that point. So um, applaud not only Angela, but Block for the work that they are doing. So let me tell you more about uh, Angela. I will try to do her service, but uh, there's so much more I could say, but I will try to keep this within uh, two minutes. Angela Lang is the Executive Director of Black Leaders Organizing Communities, or as we call them, Black. Angela was born and raised in the heart of Milwaukee. She has an extensive background in community organizing. In the past, she served as both an organizer and state council director for SEIU, working on such campaigns as the Fight 415. Before joining Black's team as Executive Director, Angela was a political director with For Our Future Wisconsin. She is a graduate of Emerge Wisconsin and has had the pleasure of being the featured trainer for Emerge's Diversity Weekend since 2015. Angela is motivated by making substantial and transformative change in her community while developing young local leaders of color. What an important mission. Her journey in organizing hasn't always been easy, though it all, through it all, excuse me. She has remained a fierce advocate for securing more seats at the table for those who represent the new American majority. It is my pleasure to now turn it over to Angela. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, thank you all um, for inviting me here, allowing me to speak. Thank you, Rose, for all the work that you do. And thank you, SJA, for everything. Um, it truly, as someone that has done all of our work in Wisconsin, 
um, it truly is important to have all hands on deck. We understand how close 2018 was. We understand how close 2020 was. Wisconsin continues to be one of those states that um, is typically decided within a percentage point. And so having folks come in and support wherever they can is so, so, so important. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm so excited to, to be here. And so I want to take a little bit of a step back um, and uh, explain block for folks that don't know. I also realize I'm wearing the exact same uh, shirt and sweater that I am in my headshot, which is hilarious. Um, but block was formed in 2017 really as a response to the 2016 election. We know what happened in 2016. Uh, we don't need to revisit that. We, we live here, we know what happens, right? Um, but at the same time, I think what frustrated me um, even more is that there was a lot of progressive and folks that identified as Democrat that said, well, if you people would have just voted, uh, we wouldn't be here right now. And I think that that was um, misplaced anger to say the least. <laughs> um, you know, our community is some of the most disenfranchised and least engaged. Milwaukee is home to one of the most incarcerated zip codes, 53206. It's the most incarcerated zip code in the country. Um, and with the United States incarcerating those people, we can actually say that it's the most incarcerated zip code in the world. And so we intentionally moved our office into the 53206 zip code. We target the north side of Milwaukee because unfortunately Milwaukee is incredibly segregated. So we can, even if the data is wrong in our database or in the, the voter, um, access network, the van, as folks know, uh, we are able to just say, hey, we're going to target the north side of Milwaukee and, and hit the bulk of our people. We're also really excited to have been able to expand to the Racine and Kenosha areas. Um, for those that may remember, uh, Jacob Blake was shot and paralyzed. We had our own, um, you know, incident shortly after George Floyd and Breonna Taylor in 2020. And so there's still a lot of momentum and there's still a lot of challenges to be dealt with. And we um, kind of were recruited to help expand to the, to the Kenosha area. We were only targeting Racine, but we knew Kenosha was important as well. So for for us, we want to have a year-round civic engagement type of model. Uh, we understand that this kind of for us, by us model is incredibly powerful. Um, I hate gatekeepers, but sometimes we have to gatekeep our own community a little bit um, because the conversations go further if they're from folks that are from the community and can also relate to the voters on doors. Um, but with that being said, it's still important for us more broadly in the state of Wisconsin, even though we're very hyper-focused on Black voters in southeastern Wisconsin, it's important for us to really bridge this urban and rural divide. And so having this conversation about race class narrative, you know, we, we constantly think about how are we having people understand uh, Black Lives Matter that live in maybe the Northwoods of Wisconsin that maybe typically wouldn't maybe interact with Black people because there aren't large Black populations where they live. Um, we have done uh, really great work and we've done joint op-eds and joint podcasts with this Wisconsin Farmers Union. And I knew going into it what the goal was. It was to highlight how similar our communities are when it comes to issues of healthcare and education and rural communities and bridging this urban and rural divide. But even in the middle of the conversation, I myself was still really surprised by um, how much our communities align and I think we also understand that there is um, this, I would say, kind of this 1%, if people remember um, the 1% type of movement and, uh, you know, take back Wall Street and, and all of those things and Occupy Wall Street. Um, I think that really started a conversation about this, like us versus them. And in this country, unfortunately, um, there is kind of the... Um, the the zero sum game of if you get the slice of the pie that means i get less and so instead of being mad at the people that are giving the that are giving out the slices of pie and complaining that your slice is too small you're mad at the person that actually has a bigger slice of the pie than you or is trying to get a large slice of the pie and so understanding that um there is opportunities and there are challenges where people are able to um unfortunately not get the basic services that they need and then we're able to be divided by race because sometimes racism and white supremacy is such a big thing that it's hard to understand the um the ways that we intersect the ways that the urban and rural um, communities actually are more joint 
together and have more commonality than people expect. And so for us, we want to make sure that we are having these conversations. And it's not just a one way street. It's not like, oh, we want to educate folks in the North Woods about what it means to be Black in Wisconsin. We also want to make sure that we're doing education in our community because we are not perfect. Um, but having people understand what the plight of Wisconsin farmers are that are up north, understanding that there are Black farmers that we don't always talk about that kind of get erased from farming type of narratives. And so for us, it's so important to figure out how are we able to kind of really amplify some of our challenges together, understanding that if you live in a rural place, sometimes it may be very difficult for you to get access to quality health care. Um, even if you know, you're in a in a city, at the same time, it may still be hard and a challenge to access quality health care because we've known that there's been attacks on specifically one of the last black owned or black hospitals on the north side of Milwaukee. So there's that's just one example of access to health care, understanding access to democracy. Um, these are really, really challenging times where a lot of times we see that our democracy is being eroded in one way, shape or form. And a lot of times it's due to challenges of voter suppression. Um, we see that voter suppression is, is a challenge when we are closing um, different polling places and rural communities have to figure out, oh, I need to drive 20 miles to my voting place. Uh, we understand that uh, Wisconsin is divided racially, but that is an intention. Uh, we're divided intentionally in order to not come together to build that collective power. So we always start our conversations, even though we're knocking doors in the Black community in Milwaukee, Racine, and Kenosha, we always start our conversations with what does it look like for the Black community to thrive? And that is a question that other people can ask their communities that have been not invested in and unfortunately have left behind. And so by asking those questions about thriving, people are thinking about the needs of their community. Hey, we could use a speed bump. Hey, we could use, you know, a hospital over here or, you know, there's always, you know, so much reckless driving, but we're only talking about it in the frames of black people and not the white man on his fourth DUI in one of the most drunkest states in the, in the, in the country. And so for us, we want to challenge a lot of those things. We're having these conversations about thriving. We're being able to see these commonalities in ways that people haven't before. You know, I think there are so many times that we've had conversations of what does it look like to have these broader conversations. I've been talking to elected officials about how can we do some sort of bus tour or have some sort of conversation where we're highlighting these commonalities because unfortunately everyone's access to democracy is not the same. And for us, we have a democracy organizer. We're very excited to have a democracy organizer on staff. Um, but for us, we really want to have this conversation and challenge what is voter suppression? What is democracy? I think we think of traditional things of limiting polling location or early vote hours or things like that. But also if people's basic needs aren't being met, then people are gonna have a very hard time trying to participate in our democracy. So having safe and affordable and stable housing is a democracy issue. You know, I think of my my single white mom who's trying to figure out how to raise a black child on her own, um, ended up getting terminally ill and was trying to figure out like how do I how do I make all of this work and still under understanding the intersectionality and all of our common struggles. I understood um, the fight for 15, you know, when people wanted to specifically um, either home care workers or fast food workers wanted to say, I want $15 and a union for my workplace for working at McDonald's. I remember liking that to my mom being sick. She would go to chemotherapy like clockwork every Tuesday and then would go and pick up a night shift at the local Walgreens three blocks away that she could walk to. Because unfortunately, as she said, she said, listen, I may be dying, but bills don't stop. Right. And so understanding that there are so many folks that have these common struggles, that understanding that barriers and access to democracy is limited. Absolutely. It is more escalated and there's extra labor and there's extra challenges by being a person of color and specifically a black person. But trying to dig deep and really understand that there are um, opportunities for us to come together and have this conversation. And so for us being able to do this work on a year round basis, basis, we're able to dig into those deeper conversations. We don't just talk to you when there's an election. We want to engage you. 
And so there are times that we have three separate um, conversations. One, we want to turn a non-voter into a voter, which is probably the biggest conversation we'll have. Um, you may get somebody and then they see something on the news and then they lose faith in the process. That is probably the biggest conversation we have. Two, we want to feel that people understand what they're voting for. We don't want people just to vote for candidates because we tell them to. We want people to vote for the state Supreme Court candidate or the sheriff because they understand the importance and the roles and responsibilities and the duties of that office and why it's important to make a voice heard about that particular office. Um, and then three, lastly, we want people to vote for the candidates that we support. Um, and so if we're able to, to do all of those things, that's, those are longer conversations. And those conversations aren't necessarily linear. linear. They may bounce back and forth into different times as well. Um, but at the end of the day, these are three big conversations that we need to have on a year-round basis. And based off of those conversations, we're also able to bridge that gap. We're able to say, hey, uh, did you know that people even next door to you um, are having these problems? It got to a point where we're adding in our script, yeah, I hear that a lot because a lot of the challenges that we're hearing, we hear from, from neighbors, but we also want to do a little bit of education and let folks know that we're not the only ones experiencing that. And I worked for a labor union for three years. And one of the first things that they teach you when you're doing union organizing is that there is strength in numbers. And that's something I've always carried with me. And so understanding, yes, our community has unique challenges in and of itself that no one understands, even other people of color, Black communities deal with a lot, just the same way as Latino communities and indigenous communities and Asian AAPI communities. We all have our unique challenges, but we also have a certain commonality of struggle and oppression um, that aligns with other people of color and other working class folks. And I think it's important to be able to do that education. And so not only are we able to educate our own community, but where we're able to, we're able to kind of bridge those connections. We're able to share that power podcast and expand people's thinking. And hopefully, even though we don't do rural organizing, our strategic partnerships and the ways that we interact with each other, people see a value and people say, you know what, I do want to come together with those farmers up north or the folks up north that are saying, hey, I don't have a lot of Black people in my town, but at the end of the day, my values align with Black Lives Matter and I want to learn more. We want to harness um, those conversations. So we're using our, our leverage. We're working with race class narrative folks and all in Wisconsin specifically. Uh, Rebecca Lynch, who runs the race class narrative uh, work in our state is one of my best friends and I'm very grateful to have her ear. She has helped us on messaging um, in a way that kind of broadens out our issues that also resonates with other folks and really kind of approach it from a values-based standpoint. And so I will stop there. Um, there is a lot that I could talk about, including how Ron Johnson is terrible. So please sign up for all of the phone banking shifts in Wisconsin, because uh, we need to get rid of them. And every tactic is incredibly helpful. Um, so every single thing that we've done is what it was able to uh, push us over the edge, not only in 2018, but 2020 as well. So we want to make sure that we're replicating all of those tactics too. So thank you all, you know, for being here at, you know, eight o'clock uh, on a Wednesday night and, and leaning into this. And, and thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Angela. Now everybody sees that was not familiar with uh, Angela, what I mean. And um, I have to say, we are lucky to have you, Angela. And uh, this is not hyperbole. I feel that you are Wisconsin Stacey Abrams. So uh, thank you for being you. I have quite a few questions. We have limited time here with you. I do see a question from Kathy. So to uh, play fair here, I will start with uh, Kathy's question. So here goes, Angela. What is the impact of evictions on people living in rural and urban communities? That's a great question. Um, I can't speak so much to the impact of the rural folks because one, I'm not a part of that community. I think I have a little bit of an understanding. Um, but I think more broadly, you know, we started to dabble into housing specifically when it came to evictions. Uh, I, I think a lot of folks um, that are in my position did a lot of traveling pre-COVID and I would travel to these different conferences, talk to different organizers and everyone had a housing campaign. 
And I'm like, Milwaukee doesn't have a housing campaign. Like we're not, no one's working on housing, but housing is clearly an issue in our city and we're terrible. And there's all these terrible statistics in Milwaukee around affordable housing and gentrification and really terrible landlords. This is one landlord in particular, three out of four evictions are coming from him. And he does like 200 some evictions a week. It's terrible. Um, and so there is, thank you. I was actually just about to get there. Um, Evicted is a really great book. I haven't had the chance to read it myself, but I heard it was a really great book. Um, I also probably haven't read it because I'm just like, I know what this feels like. Do I need to read a book about my life? But Evicted actually talks about the challenges of being evicted in the city of Milwaukee. Um, unfortunately, we've seen issues of domestic violence. And, um, you know, if there's a, a loud argument or something like that, even the woman or the, the victim of domestic violence is unfortunately evicted instead of actually getting help that she needs. So there's a lot of challenges when it comes to evictions, at least in the city of Milwaukee, but we've been working with groups like Souls to the Poles. There's um, a lot of different challenges, especially when it came to the federal ARPA dollars as well. We wanted to say that at least 200 million of the ARPA dollars went to affordable housing. We see this in like a short term and long term with a lot of challenges. So the pandemic, I think, exacerbated a lot of challenges that we've had um, and really shot a magnifying glass um, to folks that may not have been aware of these challenges or directly impacted by those challenges. So how do we provide people immediate relief in the middle of a pandemic, right? COVID is kind of subsiding, but I'm pretty sure that we're going to have another spike because everyone's getting too relaxed right now. Um, but what does it look like to protect evictions and have an eviction moratorium during the pandemic when things are, are cha more challenging? But then also, how can we sustain that long term? Because our, our um, housing issues have been a challenge long before the pandemic. And if people don't have stable housing, they're hard to reach. And then you're and that's another way of diluting Black political power. I can imagine the same is um, true for a rural place as well. And, um, and also, like, rural towns are a lot more spread out. Milwaukee's incredibly dense. So we're able to hit every door. And even when we hit every door and we're talking to folks, um, sometimes there's three uh, houses boarded up just on one block. And so, I, you know, in rural communities, I can imagine that housing is a lot more scarce um, just because there isn't as much, there isn't like the landlords, there isn't the gentrification, there isn't a lot of this housing, even though it may not be affordable to us, it still is there in one way, shape or form. And I can imagine it might be similar challenges in rural communities too, unfortunately. Great answer, thank you so much. I wanna share that um, I did see, I can't remember when it was, Angela, maybe a couple of weeks ago, it was a uh, Nightline. Uh, I believe uh, our channel seven here in Illinois and it followed um, three families looking for housing. I can't recall the neighborhood. And then there's a neighborhood where uh, African-Americans do congregate, but um, it was a, a very good, um, I thought, uh, job at reporting. and. I do believe that despite everything and all our devices, I think a lot of folks are watching the, um, our channel two, five and seven, whatever you have in Wisconsin. So that was uh, very um, informative for me and I shared it with some of our people. So uh, we have just a short amount of time with you left and um, I do not, apologies if I missed it, but I do not see questions from others. So I have about six here, I'll, uh, I'll choose one. When we, uh, my husband and I came out and in 2018, we learned that um, rightly so, you are concentrating on the um, community to reach out to the community, which makes perfect sense. And at the time um, I was asking, what could we do? Cause we wanted to come back and you referred us, I believe to um, Action Now that our friend Deborah Harris used to be the executive director. What can we do? What can the folks in um, Illinois do? We have been working with, um, West Dems and we write uh, vote forward letters to Wisconsin and uh, other things that I'm not thinking of, postcards, of course. So Angela, what can we do for you? I love this question. Um, yes, you know, I, I mentioned that we're kind of gatekeeping a little bit. The whole crux of our model is having folks from the community educate other folks from the community. It's important to build that knowledge in our community and share that amongst our community. So I, while I appreciate the enthusiasm of wanting to knock doors or to phone bank with our team, um, we want to reserve that for our team and that we're building, we're the ones building those connections. But the way I typically answer that question is one, I 
be a bad executive director if I didn't talk about fundraising, right? All of this costs money. We plan to have 100 ambassadors. And when I say ambassadors, that's kind of canvassers on steroids. We put our folks through a lot of training, but we want to have 100 ambassadors by November, COVID willing, right? If we are able to ramp up our field program the way that we're used to, we plan to have 100 ambassadors. Um, if COVID keeps going up and down and we don't know, we want to keep everyone safe. And so we might continue in a hybrid model, half digital, half in the field. And all of that costs money. Um, our ambassadors are paid um, between 19, or they're paid $19 an hour. And then our lead ambassadors are paid $22 an hour. Um, and then they work 30 to 35 hours respectively. So uh, you can imagine the ambassador program itself is just a $1.2 million um, entity in and of itself. So that is our, our main crux. That is our direct voter contact. You can donate at blockbyblock.org. Uh, we have C3, C4, and PAC capabilities. So whatever you're interested in and fits your tax criteria that you're interested in, you can donate to all of those places. Two, understanding not everybody has disposable income in the middle of a pandemic. Um, we want to make sure that we're making connections, right? Like, do you have um, a rich uncle that might be interested in supporting our work? Do you have a brother that does a podcast in your basement and you think I'd be a good guest? Um, do you know somebody in another state that does similar work? We want to be able to be connected to so many other people. We want to amplify our work. And again, I think that there's strength in numbers. Um, and then lastly, three, I understand that people may not have disposable income, may not have a connection or you know a wealth of networks. But one thing that everyone can do is amplify our content on social social media, or if you subscribe to our weekly emails, um, then being able to forward that. And I say this point intentionally, because for whatever reason, we're in the middle of whitewashing history. Um, we are not we no one on this call clearly, but um, people in this country for whatever reason think January sixth was like a school group, right? So we constantly are whitewashing history, we're eliminating the work of black organizing and, and BIPOC, you know, people of color in general organizing. So being able to amplify our lived experiences, our stories is so important for us. And so for, for me, I try to think about storytelling. I do a weekly email that isn't like, hey, give me $5 or I can't turn on the lights. It's very authentic. For those that subscribe, it's very raw. It's kind of a diary entry every Friday. Um, but for me, we want to tell that story. This is how we're feeling. Sometimes organizing is ugly. We don't always feel the greatest. It sucks. It's depressing. But you know, being able to provide that very real and authentic um, perspective is part of our storytelling. And so I think it's really important to be able to amplify. And whether it's Block or other organizations where you live or any other place across the country, Stacey Abrams, whoever, amplify the content of, um, of organizers that are on the ground so that isn't getting lost. If people do want to subscribe to our weekly email, I did drop my um, my email address in the chat. I will drop it again before I dip off. And then folks can also, in any follow-up, can feel free to post it. Um, but you can email me. You can DM me. Um, a lot of folks automatically get onto it if they donate, not saying you have to. Um, but that's how people typically get on our list. But I'm able to add uh, folks manually as well. So if you just kind of shoot us an email, um, I'll make sure to add you. We did have a glitch. There was a, a part on our website where you were able to kind of just like sign up for our newsletter that wasn't syncing with our MailChimp stuff. So I can't guarantee that if you sign up through our website, it's going to make it. But if you shoot me an email, um, I can guarantee that I will manually add you. And then I will drop my information again in the chat. Angela, thank you. I know you have a full night ahead of you, even though you are leaving us, you are going forward with other work. I want to apologize to Heather. Heather, I'm so sorry. I missed your question, but uh, Angela has uh, graciously given her our, her email. So uh, Heather, please, Heather, uh, in her own right, is doing a lot of uh, racial equity and justice work. So I hope you can uh, both connect. And uh, Angela, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much. Um, thank you. Please don't be a stranger whenever you have the time. If we do ever make it back to uh, Wisconsin, I've been doing a lot of phone banking myself, but we do save campus. I really hope I can uh, buy you a cup of coffee or something. I would um, love that. I'm I would grateful. love to connect. Thank also, you. if anybody is coming to Milwaukee, please hit us up. We'd love to have you in our office and to welcome you as well. So thank you so much. Thank you, Angela. And again, I test Thanks. to them being such excellent hosts. So with that, now I am turning it over to my uh, colleague, uh, Kim, and she is going to introduce herself and our next esteemed guest speaker.
Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. I am Kim Garnett. I am co-lead of this group, and I am very pleased tonight to introduce Jessica Motzinger. Uh, Jessica is founder and co-lead of Indivisible Metro East and an, organ and, and an organizer, uh, and she is representing the Poor People's Campaign Illinois. Uh, Jessica has a fierce work ethic and long history of accomplishments. So I will introduce to some and present to others, Jessica. Jessica, you're on mute. Thank you so much, Kim, for gracious introduction. Um, again, my name is Jessica Motzinger and I've been asked to help assist as a state campaign organizer for Illinois for the repairs of the breach and the Poor People's Campaign um, to try to organize and mobilize our state into going and supporting the Moral March in Washington, DC, June 18th. So if we could go ahead, there's a video promo. It's only a few minutes long. We'll get that started and then I'll go ahead and start the slide. Thank you. We welcome you to the launch of the mass poor people's low wage assembly and moral march on Washington, D.C., June 18, 2022. We are a new, unsettling force, and we are powerful. A new, unsettling force, and we are here. We're rising up to demonstrate the compelling power that we, poor and low income people, have to reconstruct society from the bottom up. And we need to do it with the loudest voices possible, the biggest actions possible. Because we know that there is no scarcity in this land. The only scarcity is the moral will to do what's right. are those with sub-minimum wage jobs who can't afford sky-high rent. People with disabilities are the fastest growing minority group. It's crazy to me that in 2021, it's still legal for workplaces to pay a sub-minimum wage to people with disabilities. There are still so much trial and tribulations that we go through as indigenous people. We can't get a decent wage to sustain ourselves, nor can we get adequate housing. Veterans across this nation say enough is enough. We can't pat essential workers on the back on one day and then cut their health care the next day. Health is a political choice. What more do I need to do to prove that my voice is just as valuable as anyone else's? There are still forces in denial that would try to slow walk our transition to a clean economy and a just future for us all. We have an immoral system run by moral people but together we walk, and we walk and we fight. It's time for a change. Reconstruyamos esta gran nación. See, we are people of resilience as we fight these interlocking injustices together. When we work together, mobilize together, and rise together, we become a voice for the voiceless, and we become an agent of change in a time where great change is needed. We need the third reconstruction to ensure that deaf people, people with disabilities, and all people can have the right to live and to thrive. Together, we can change the world until the poor are lifted, the workers are paid, the sick are healed, the vote is not suppressed, police cutting killing is stopped, land and water is not poisoned. War is not pushed, promoted and promulgated. Humanity is respected. Children are protected. Civil rights, labor rights, human rights are never neglected until these things are actualized. We've got work to do. And if we do it together, if the rejected work together, Generations yet unborn will rise up and remember us for the work we did. And together, 
We will change the nation. I know justice is coming soon. Do you believe that up today? Thank you very much. Now, before we get started, I want y'all to have paid attention to how varied and how wide the issues and the people that gathered and made statements were. And that's why we're here. The Poor People's Campaign and Repairs of the Breach is reaching across the aisle to every sector of our communities and they need our help. We have to join together from veterans to disabled folks, to activists like us, to organizers, to faith leaders, to congregants up and down as massive and varied as our issues are, that's the response and the allies that we need. So June 18th, the Moral March on Washington, it is not just a day of action. It is a declaration of an ongoing committed moral movement to one, shift the moral narrative, two, build power, and three, make real policies to fully address poverty and low wealth from the bottom up. June 18th, beginning at 10 a.m. in Washington, D.C., the Mass Poor People's and Low Wage Workers Assembly and Moral March on Washington will be a generation, generationally transformative and disruptive gathering of poor and low wealth people, state leaders, faith community, moral allies, unions, and partnering organizations like us. The assembly is pulling a point of organizing from fall of 2021 all the way through the summer of 2022 and will spring us forward to the 2022 elections. And all along the way, we will be doing the acronym MORE. We will be mobilizing, we will be organizing, we will be registering, educating and engaging and empowering people for a movement that actually votes. So, some of y'all have been involved with the Poor People's Campaign. So you know it was, began in 2018. It was based off of Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, War on Poverty. And they started with a historic wave of nonviolent civil disobedience. And the National Call for Moral Revival is a national campaign to address, address the interlocking injustices and systemic racism, poverty, ecological devastation, and denial of health care militarism and the war economy and the false narrative of religious nationalism. So we're going to draw on the history of a moral fusion movement. And we're going to, we, we are made up currently of over 40 state coordinating committees and over 200 partner organization, organizations right now. And we have thousands of religious leaders bringing together the nations representing over 140 million poor and low income folks. That's half of our nation. So we seek to address these injustices and revive the heart and the soul of our democracy with an agenda rooted in the needs and the priorities of the 140 million, as well as our deepest constitutional and moral values. We again, we are assembling because any nation that ignores nearly half of its citizens as we are doing right now is in a moral, economic and political crisis. So we have 140 million people who were either poor, low income, one emergency away from economic ruin before the pandemic. It's only gotten worse since then. And so while hundreds and thousands of people have died, millions are on the edge of hunger and eviction, as we were just talking about with Milwaukee is just one city and one example. So after the poor and low income people turned out in record numbers in 2020, the needs and the concerns of the 140 million are going unaddressed still and the voter suppression continues unabated. And as we know, it's actually increased. So we are going to March, June 18th. Again, that's just the beginning. It's the continuation, it is not the end. We have plenty of resources in our nation to meet all of our needs. So we have to summon the political will to do so. We've done it before as Americans and it's time to do it now. So join us, nonviolently disrupt, protest, shake up and alter the direction of our nation towards a moral agenda of love, truth, justice and equal protection under the law. As Dr. Reverend Dr. William Barber says, from this place, 
We handle the truth that poverty doesn't have to exist. It's our creation, not God's. The truth is we shouldn't be asking how much does it cost to address poverty, but how much is it costing us not to? The truth is moral policies are also good economic policy, not religious, moral. So we must do more. And more is an acronym. And it, again, stands for we want to mobilize. We're going to fully address the interlocking injustices of systemic racism, poverty, ecological devastation, and the denial of healthcare, militarism, and the false narrative of Christian nationalism. We're going to do more to change the narrative and build the power of those most impacted by these injustices more and to realize the third reconstruction agenda that can build this country from the bottom up and realize the nation that we have yet to be. So we must do more. We must mobilize our communities to Washington to demonstrate the power of a national movement of the 140 million poor and low income people, the more allies, and go out there June 18th of 2022. We're going to organize our communities of poor, low wealth people, moral advocates, and people of faith and non-faith, and all those folks who can join us in this moral movement and working to usher in a revolution of values and our moral agenda. We got to register, more registering, more people that are actually gonna vote because we have to vote and turn it out. And we're gonna educate, engage, and empower all these grassroots leaders from across the nation and build a deep-rooted long-term movement that outlasts our election cycles. And that is the goal. And so my ask is here for y'all to help join and help us by supporting We would love to have y'all become what they call mobilizing captains, basically set up and join us. So we will have buses, but you can do it with your friends, your groups. Just we need your help getting out there and getting more folks out there. So that is it. Thank you. Questions? Okay. Hey, Jessica, I always have a question. So, um, as a person of faith, I'm really always interested in knowing how we can get our faith communities behind this message of the imperative moral call that you are making and how this moral call is biblical, spiritual, and not just as some will frame it as political. Um. That is actually, I would say, above my pay grade. I am not a faith leader, but I am encouraged and heartened to see so many faith leaders that are actually stepping up and calling out the hypocrisy and the cruelty. And it goes across the board. You know, there's there's so many faiths. Father Abraham had many sons, and they don't seem to like each other much sometimes. But you know, um, I I just um, yes, and uh, I just. I am thrilled and I just hope that they keep talking about it because I honestly think they've been drowned out by the the televangelists and that movement and TV and stuff. So the more we can get the spotlight on these faith leaders and everyone that are actually speaking good common sense and and what we consider morality, you know, caring for others and least less fortunate, I think the better. So um, and yes. If you are actually within 100 miles of Madison, Wisconsin, which I know a lot of folks are tonight, we are actually having a more mobilization tour stop in Madison, Wisconsin, and that'll be March 28th. The rally starts at 4 p.m. I'll be there, and I'd love to see more folks up there. And Jessica, one more thing. I know that you had mentioned that one of the ways we could help besides financial help is also to try to figure a way that we could host an in-person event. Yes. In, in our And make the same ask because we have to get to everybody. Yes, Kathy. Right. Thank you. Absolutely. So people can get in touch with you if they sit and brainstorm yes. or, you know, they can join us uh, on the first Saturday of every month. Jessica will be joining us and and talking more about how we all can get involved and uh, go back to our own groups, our own communities, and be on the right side of history here, be on the right side of morality. Uh, And if you're a person of faith, be where God is calling you. So thank you, Jessica. Yes, 
Thank you. I, I saw a question. Will this be live online? Um, I imagine that the Illinois Poor People um, campaign coordinators will probably have something uh, on Facebook live. If not Wisconsin, there's going to be multiple states and their coordinators and everyone showing up to rally in front of the Capitol in Madison, Wisconsin. So um, I will ask, but I, I believe it should be at least on Facebook. Um, is there any other questions? Jessica, hi, it's Rose. How are you? Hi. I'm all right. Thank Good you. A little nervous, you. but thank you. <laughs> yes, no, you did great. You are, are a powerful and motivational speaker. Thank you. We're so lucky to have you as part of the Indivisible family and now sharing you with uh, Poor People's Campaign, Illinois. I uh, want to make sure that Heather's question was addressed and uh, definitely want Heather on our side to help organizing. So if she is willing, Heather, we've got some work for you. So um, just want to make sure, sorry if I missed it, just because she wants, uh, Heather wants the link to sign up for the uh, buses. And also it sounds like maybe hopefully she's willing to help organize. So perhaps uh, Jessica, Heather and I need to get on a phone call soon. Heather is a powerhouse. I any Any group besides, I already am honored to have her help. Any group would be greatly honored and benefited by having Heather involved. So thank you, big honor. And I will kick that out to you. Um, I can kick out my email address and a link to the Illinois Poor Peoples. And then um, do you want me to send the flyers? There's actually a QR code that will take you to the, the bus, for example, um, website. I can send those. I'll put them in chat. Yes, that would be uh, great. Takes me a while. I had first time on Zoom. No worries. Find that uh, unmute <laughs> button. But um, yes, I think that would be really helpful. We uh, will make a announcement. Don't want to steal Jonathan's thunder, but uh, we will be following up with the recording and any links our uh, speakers want us to send. And uh, Jonathan will be uh, reminding everyone at the end about that. Any closing remarks, Jessica? Uh, no, just please, I would love to talk to your group. I would love to talk to you. This is a statewide campaign. We're trying to get as many people out as possible. We got till June. So please come along with me for this wild ride. There's many other poor people campaign and mobilizing captains. If I'm not your cup of tea, please find one. There's lots of us out there. And I appreciate all your time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jessica, and everyone who's been uh, for everyone for the questions and so forth. Um, I'm now going to toss it back once again to Kathy to introduce our uh, third speaker of the evening. Thank you, Jonathan. Well, Jessica was saying something about being honored to be in this space, and I am so honored and excited to be able to introduce our next speaker, Penn Garvin, whose passion for organizing and social justice will definitely inspire everyone here tonight to get involved and start building bridges of understanding and unity. As a facilitator for the Hub for Progress, Penn is a longtime community organizer, beginning with the civil rights movement, the women's movement, ACT UP during the AIDS epidemic, the anti-nuclear movement, non-intervention in Latin America movement, and others. Trained in mediation and organizational development, Penn brings a strong commitment to building healthy, vibrant social movements that work together to bring about social justice. Penn, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We're so excited to have you here. Thank you. I it, it, This has been wonderful. Uh, sometimes people ask me, where do you get your source of keeping going in the, in the midst of everything that's going on? And I always say, from Zoom meetings, because <laughs> we sit and I see all these wonderful people. And now more recently, I've been seeing wonderful people in Oregon and now in Illinois and across the country. And it, that's what gives me real hope for what's going on. It's been um, really interesting to hear both what Angela and Jessica are doing. And I wanna say, and I'm gonna date myself now, I wanna say, I love the Poor People's Campaign. I was involved in the first Poor People's Campaign back in the 60s. And I was so thrilled when I realized it was being picked up again and started again. It is a very, very important movement. One of the strongest movements that's going on because it, it really combines 
the morality and the politics. And it's really an important movement. So I'm thrilled to be on. Um, I'm going to be talking more about the very specifics of race class narrative. I live out, I, I, I grew up in rural Pennsylvania where I live right now. I went to, and for many years, I lived in San Francisco and I lived for years in Nicaragua. And now I'm back in this very rural area, Trump land. There are many signs around and that's who I'm surrounded by, but also very good people who are involved in organizing out here. And one of the things that I really like about being out here is that I am learning that rural organizing is really very different from urban organizing. I was an organizer in San Francisco for many years and I thought, oh, I'll come back here. My parents were from here and they were still alive when I came back. I'll come back here and just kind of use a little of my organizing skills in a rural area that I have learned in an urban area. Not the same. There are really some very big differences in rural organizing. But one of the things that I like about the race class narrative is that it really is the way of reaching out and saying we're all in this together. And it's really, as Angela was talking about, now that's where the rubber meets the road and same with the Poor People's Campaign. That's where we really have to implement the idea of we're all in this together. And it's not always easy to do, but out here, what I've done is work with uh, starting to educate people in this very rural area about how to use race class narrative in the work that we do. What I like about race class narrative is based on research. It's not based on what we think we should be saying. It's really based on what is effective with people in across the, across the, the country. So it has a kind of uh, generalized effectiveness that has been tested. It's not based on what we think that we think people should be hearing. The other thing that I like, I'm gonna put up my hand because I use this a lot. If my thumb here is progressives, okay, that's who we are, all of us here doing this kind of work. We're all the people in the thumb here. People next to the, in, in the index finger, these people agree with what we do. They may not be out there doing it, but they agree pretty much with what we do the, in the stances that we take. Then my little finger here is like the insurrectionists. They're the ones out here that, that uh, believe a fraud and so forth and so on. And the ring finger are the folks who are not, they wouldn't have done an insurrection on the Capitol, but they believe in that. So you have those two groups. Then you have the middle finger that toggles back and forth between the thumb and the index finger and the ring and little finger. They toggle back and forth depending upon what they hear most. If they hear mostly right wing kind of them, negative, those people are to blame. They're the ones who's causing the problem. They're gonna go in that direction. If they hear mainly things about values and understanding that when we join together, that's when we get the things, good things in life, when we're working together, they'll go more in that direction. So really race class narrative is a way of anchoring the thumb ourselves in a common language and a common way of messaging. The right is very good at messaging. They have a common, they have very clear, short little things that they can say, you know, that people glom onto. We in, in, in our movement are not as good about that. And so part of race class narrative for the thumb is to give us a common language. That means that we all need to be using that common language in order to spread it around and have it, no matter whether I'm in Illinois, in California, or here in rural Pennsylvania, we're saying the same thing. So it, it helps anchor those people. The index finger here, it helps those people to reinforce why they believe in you know, the good things, the good values that we have. It reinforces that rather than allows them to wonder, well, why am I thinking so differently from what I hear in the news every day? It helps reinforce that. And these middle fingers, it helps pull them 
the ones who toggle back and forth and it helps pull them here. So race class narrative towards us and towards what we're doing. So race class narrative is really important in terms of keeping these three fingers moving in the right direction. Now I wanna say, first of all, that it is not easy to do. We as progressives tend to have a very different way of approaching issues. We approach them as a problem. We are very good at talking about the problem and, and, and all the facts of the problem and all the things that we should be doing about the problem, et cetera. It's kind of like offering tickets to the Titanic. Who's going to want to come on the Titanic? Uh, no one is going to want to come. But we sort of climb it, the doom and gloom. And, and believe me, I say these things because I've participated in everything I'm saying, I've participated in. So this is not in any way saying you're doing this, I've done this, so I understand it. Race class narrative is not easy to do because we have to get away from the problems. And I can tell you that it's not easy because I have been working for a, a close to two years now with an ongoing group that does we, we, we teach people how to, how to talk with the, with the race class narrative. And then we do ongoing support groups that meet and we talk about how to use it, where they've been successful, where they've had problems. People have a very hard time. So it's not that easy. You need to practice the race class narrative so that rolls off your tongue instead of what we've been used to doing of talking about problems. Um, the other thing that I've learned a lot, and I live, as I said, I live out in very rural white America. There are people of color out here, but really it's rural and white. And often what I get is this question. I'll be on a Zoom call and somebody will be fairly new to the group and I'll be using some of the talk about the race class narrative. And I will say such things as, no matter where you come from, no matter whether you're black, brown or white, we all want similar things. I'll say something like that. And somebody invariably says, well, we're all white out here. So why do we have to say we and then name everything? When we say we, we may, and these are white people, we mean everybody. And I had an interesting uh, experience with one uh, person who came on the Zoom call. Her face wasn't there, but I knew her. So I knew who she was by her name, but her face wasn't there. And she had just joined. And um, she was listening to this discussion and she also didn't have, she couldn't get her um, uh, uh, speaker going. So she could only do, you know, thumbs up and things like that. And I started saying this and this woman star was a woman of color. And I started saying, because when we white people talk about we, people of color do not think they are included because we live in a society that doesn't include people if you're not white, her thumb went up. Then I said, we as white people, we need to be really clear that we have reached out and named people so that they feel included in a way that they wouldn't. Thumb went up again. And I said, also, we white people had been taught by our families, and I include myself, to be colorblind. We don't see color. We don't, you know, we don't talk about race. Um, that's kind of what a lot of us were brought up to believe that's the, the good thing is not to talk about race. And when we don't talk about race, we allow racist ideas to persist if we don't talk about it. thumbs up again. And finally, I said, okay, now I'm going to tell you who's here, whose thumb has been going up is a woman of color. She sees it very differently than you do who are white. So that was very important for the group to suddenly see, oh, we, we've only seen it from one standpoint. We have not seen it from a larger standpoint. So the, the importance of, see, of including race, no matter where you are, I don't care if there are people of color in your group that you're talking about to include that. Um, the, I'm gonna have the person who is projecting uh, uh, put something up on the screen. The first one that's about values, villains and vision. Thank you. So these are the basic, and most of you know this, if you know anything about race class narrative, this is the very basic building blocks of race class narrative. 
Um, the values, we start with values. We always include people and we always talk about what the values are, that we have common values of freedom, liberty, fairness, and that's some of our common values and we need to use those and we ground our discussion or talk in those, in those words. We don't counter the argument that the person has said, that the negative things that they said, that they are doing this. There's always a negative, what people are doing to us. It's a victim and we're being victimized by them. We don't counter that. We start with values. Then we move on to an important piece, which sometimes we as progressives have a hard time doing, which is we talk about the villains. We talk about the politicians who are trying to divide us. We talk about the wealthy um, uh, uh, corporations that are trying to divide us and their greed and why they're doing that. We name who, it's, who they are, what they're doing and why they're doing it. And the reason we do this is because if you don't name a villain for why one group is not doing as well as another, you know, uh, children in black schools are not doing as well as children in white schools. If we don't name the villains and why we've been divided and why that happens, people will just jump to the conclusion that the people who are not doing so well are not doing well for their own reasons. They, they are not doing well because they're not is active, they're not as industrious, they're not as smart, they're not as whatever. You have to talk about villains, even though it's sometimes is hard for us to, to do that. Um, the right does not have trouble naming villains. We all are you know, named as villains very easily. The D Democrats are you know, evil people, et cetera, but we have a hard time, but we have to do that. And then the vision. Um, and the vision is basically when we all come together and we work together just as both Angela and Jessica have been saying, that's when we can get the things that we need. Um, would you put up the next slide that has, um, this is an example of a winning narrative. So no matter where we come from or what our color, most of us work hard for our families. So here is naming right away, you're, you're mentioning color in here you're, and, you're, and you're naming a value, working hard. But today, certain politicians and their greedy lobbyists hurt everyone by handing kickbacks to the rich, defunding our schools, and threatening our seniors with cuts to Medicare and Social Security. So here you're naming who they are, certain politicians, and it's good to not say all, because somebody will argue with all, but certain politician and their greedy lobbyists, they're hurting by what are they doing? They're handing kickbacks to the rich, et cetera. And then they turn around and point the finger for our hard times at poor families, black people and new immigrants. So you name what the, what the villain is doing right there. You name the villain and what they're doing. We need to join together with people from all walks of life to fight for our future, just like we won better wages, safing, safer workplaces and civil rights in our past. This is really talking about coming together, but it's doing something else. It's referring back to something we've done in our history that has really worked. And that's an important thing to do because one of the things that is hard to um, make sure that people understand is if we come together, we will get what we need. People can sometimes think, what's the point? If there's no point in working, I'm sure many of you in your organizing run into that. People who feel cynical that it's not going to work. But if we really do talk about what's happened in the past, by joining together, we can elect new leaders who work for all of us, not just the wealthy few. So here you have an example. And as I say, it is really important. And we do this a lot in the working group that I, I, I work with, and that is that we have people practice. We have people have an elevator speech and they practice it because really race class narrative is based on this. People hear it over and over and over again. It might be a different topic. It might be a different, uh, slightly different wording, but basically they hear the same elements over and over again, but we have to practice that. So if it's not repeated, it's not successful. You can have the best message, but it needs to be repeated. And I think that's what we're trying to do. And I'm very excited that this RCN, uh, that you pulled together this uh, conference and this RCN 
way of approaching messaging and way of working is um, getting such such traction now. And I, I think that if we all practice it and work on it, we can have a much more unified progressive stance just as the right has had and we're moving in the right direction. I'm gonna stop there and just um, ask if people have any questions or any comments. Thank you. Thank you, Penn. <clears throat> I'm gonna check first our chat to see if we have a question here. And I have a question. Uh, my question would be, what is the biggest difference between the rural and urban areas in terms of getting this message across? Because the group here represents some urban folks and some rural folks. And what would each of us have to look out in terms of our messaging then? I would say one of the differences is that um, in our rural area, we are dealing with people who have um, very conservative viewpoints that sometimes we don't understand enough about their, where their conservative viewpoints come from. Um, they are really different from um, more progressive viewpoints. And so certain things are gonna sound different and hit them differently that we, and, and they have, and they also out here in rural areas have limited exposure to people of color or to other ways of thinking or other. Um, when I lived in San, I lived in San Francisco for many years and then moved back out here, even though I've been born here, it was a shock. It was a shock to me um, because you're talking with people who really do not have the, ex the uh, experience that people have who live in cities and have to get along with a lot of different people. And so I would say that's another one of the limited exposure means that there's a limited range of what you can talk about that helps them understand. That's a good question, Kathy, thank you. Well, you're welcome. And, and that, that, that's a great answer. I, I'm always seeking to try to understand and you know, that's always part of all the training that we've ever had is seek first to understand. I think that's yes. Stephen Covey. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. No. Rose has a question here. Uh, she would like to know more about the small group training for RCN and the training, the trainer concept. So, yeah, so um, if people are interested, um, that's something that I, a training of trainers and having a group out, out there, I just, did this, a similar thing with a group out in, in Oregon. Um, but you have a lot in your area. There's a lot of going on in Wisconsin. Um, so, but I think having a, a group of you that is really trained in, in, in being able to go through the steps and show some things, talk about dog whistle, get people sort of thinking about where this comes from and understanding, um, not just that there's a lot of resources, but understanding why it's put together this way, why this works, this format works uh, um, better. And um, there's a lot of, there are a lot of good resources. The working group meets to help each other practice. That's really what it's about. And so people will, for instance, bring something that they were gonna, they've written for um, a letter to the editor and will sort of help them include some more elements that might be different. They might have approached it from a, a, a problem standpoint. We help them kind of move more towards a values and why things aren't working because of the villains and then what they can do um, to bring people together. So it's, it's a, a slow process of helping people really reorient how we think about how we approach these issues and using RCN in an ongoing way. Thank you, that, that is a... Uh... A great answer. And someone asked, what can we read? What What's oh, some my. examples of what we can read for background information on this? Okay. So I'm glad you asked. That's a very good question. I'm a big reader. So and that the, was Marianne Stevens. Oh, okay. Thank you, Marianne. Okay. So the first book that I would suggest, if you really want to dive into this, is the beginning of this started with Ian, I-A-N, Ian Haney Lopez, L-O-P-E-Z, dog whistle politics. 
And then he also has another one called um, uh, something right, uh, left, uh, Merge Left, Merge Left. Very good books. He is a real understander of how uh, how all this works and how we've gotten into this place that the right can use such dog whistles to get us off course and to be blaming each other. So that would be the first. The second book is, the, the third book I would recommend is Heather um, McGee's The Sum of Us, S-U-M, The Sum mm -hmm. of Us. She was one of the first ones with Demos, which was the, one of the organizations that came together along with Anat Shankar Sorio's um, uh, work. Um, so The Sum of Us is another one that was, is very good. And the, the other thing that I would say is, if you get on Words That Win, or um, there are many places, anything, and she's a character, is Anat Shankar Sorio. She Just listening to some of her um, podcasts, and she has a, a, a many podcasts, she has a website, but um, A-S-O, Anat Schenker Osorio, O-S-O-R-I-O. Her stuff is very good and she's very, she's very funny, really. She can be very irreverent. And the last thing I would say is that there is um, Freedom Rising is a, um, pot, is a, uh, a webinar that happens every other Wednesdays um, and it has to do with how the context that we're in politically and how the messaging, they do constant work on messaging and how that um, is, can be used for the context we're in. Like right now we're dealing with Ukraine and what's going on there and Russia and so forth. They do constant um, focus group testing and, and doing that, uh, uh, getting the, the, the vocabulary and the phrasing that works the best with people and um, that's on Wednesdays. And I would highly recommend you can just sign up and go to Freedom Rising with um, uh, uh, Mike, um, Michael Podeser, and that Shenko Sorio and Jiggy Geronimo are the, the three that run that. It's very, it's, it's very good. I hope that, I hope I didn't overwhelm you. <laughs> that was complete. No, that was just wonderful. I discovered, Ken, just in the little that I spoke with you on the phone, that you are just an incredible fountain of information, enthusiasm, and inspiration. And I just couldn't be more excited <laughs> that you came to share this space. Thank you. And, well, great, and grace us with your presence. I, I've been I've been very happy to be here because it's really given me a shot in the arm to hear what's happening in, out in Illinois. So thank you. Well, you're very welcome. We have some amazing people working everywhere in Illinois and Wisconsin, and uh, yeah, it's 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 very humbling to be in this space <laughs> yes. with so many people. Yes, thank you. Thank you all very much. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Thanks. Thank you so much. And I think I'm turning this back over to Jonathan. Yes, thank you, Kathy. Um, and thank you all, to all of our speakers and everyone who presented because any of and everyone who asked questions because yeah, this has been an amazing conversation. I, I think uh, very informative and educational for everyone. And so this has been wonderful. I'm glad that we could uh, help host and do this. And I do want to remind everyone that um, you know, and thank everyone for coming and for listening to all this and for sticking, you know, sticking around for the whole hour and a half and everything. Um, I think it was uh, hard to believe an hour and a half went by. But anyway, um, so we will be sending the slides and links uh, to register to, to all everyone who registered. And we will make a recording of the meeting available. So you will be getting that information that will be coming up. Uh, I'm not sure if we're going to be editing that a little bit just to get rid of the ums and uhs and pauses. I don't think there were many of those tonight, so it should be a pretty quick thing to do. But um, it's often something that we do to just kind of tweak, trim this all up and get this out. And so with that, I am going to, oh, and I guess we will want to put the announcements that we shared earlier um, in the chat again. If Kathy can share those again, that would be awesome. And I do want to, again, mention there was the, the uh, I'm not sure if it was stated Incredibly clearly, but there are a couple bills that are going in the at the Illinois state level right now that are related to 
to naming restrictions and Illinois is one of the most uh, restrictive, is one of the 12 most restrictive states on, on, on where and how you can change your name. And that obviously does, you know, a lot of people think, well, that, what, what, that's not a big deal. Well, it can be, and especially as we're understanding trans rights and trans communities and so forth, it can be quite an issue. And so certainly getting some, you know, getting a law passed that will make that easier for people to, to change their names and bring us more in alignment with the rest of the nation, that would be something that we really should be doing. So please, you know, look at those links and, and, and do some of those actions to let your uh, state senators and representatives, especially your state senators know uh, what's going on with that. And I believe there were a bunch of other events that are also coming up. We look forward to seeing you at uh, future Wednesday night meetings here, future, um, future ISJA meetings. And obviously we have, I think someone mentioned it, but I think it looks, uh, Words to Win is one of the groups that, that kind of builds on what we were talking about here at the end. Um, what Penn was talking about, they're going to be presenting at the next time that IISGA hosts one of these. So you'll get more of that information. So if you're still trying to wrap your head around the race class narrative and how we do all this stuff and what's the right way to frame this messaging and how we do it in a positive, productive fashion, Words that Win is, you know, come, come to our, our session, uh, um, I believe April 27th is the is when that one is going to be be happening. So on that sign up link I see just popped into the chat. So that is awesome. So with that, I think I am going to stop the recording.